Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Andre the Beast Show. Today on the show, we're going to go into a deep thought process with the owner and founder of Kush Cola, Miss Angelique Bowers. Welcome to the show, Angelique. Thank you, Andre. <clears throat> How do we start? You have so many endeavors going on and accomplished a lot of things through adversity. Definitely a beast frame of mind individual uh we met uh as a you know one of my clients and mm -hmm. and at the time you were still doing a lot of things moving in beast mode um tell the viewers a little bit about you before we start asking questions um well my name is angelique bowers i uh, own kush cola i own Oracle Paralegal Services. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also the founder of a nonprofit organization, Be a Blessing. Um, I do all kinds of things. I do taxes, construction, real estate. Um, yeah, I, I would say I have an entrepreneurial spirit. Sounds like a beast <laughs> frame of mind to me. This, we talked on the phone, and, and you shared a lot of, um, lot of, lot of information with me that I that I thought was like, wow, how can this woman keep going with the with the things that she's gone through let's first start with one of the most important parts of your life and I believe that was the um, role model in your life which was your dad tell me a little bit about your dad and how he impacted you to be who you are today well uh, my father uh, William Bowers uh, also known Bill Bowers he was um, he was my hero he was larger than life he was a big man. Um, he could look at you and just scare you to death. Sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he would tower over you, though. He was huge. Um, he was a fireman for almost 40 years. Um, once he retired, then he became a fire marshal. So uh, he also taught at the National Fire Academy out in Maryland. Um, that's what he did. That was his life, mm -hmm. was uh, being a firefighter. And he coached, you know, he coached my brother and I growing up. And, uh, you know, he was very active in the community, on the booster board, you know, always coaching something. Uh, he was a fireman out at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for 20 years as well. And before his, he'd he, he done a lot of things for the community as well as being a firefighter. Take me down the thing that he started or you noticed his charitable acts by some of the things that he did um, what were some of those things that your dad did well um, you know later in life uh, when he was a fire marshal uh, there were times when he would have to be on call um, you know and they would do that for a week at a time and it was you know if there was a fire you know someone lost their house or lost part of their house and um, they weren't able to live there you know um, the Red Cross they were there for people. It's just they can't offer very much assistance. Explain to, to the viewers what do you mean by that. The Red Cross is known for being there, and I'm not knocking the Red Cross. I think No, they, the Red they Cross a is a wonderful job. organization. But yeah. your dad took it a little bit further because some of the things the Red Cross didn't do. To, well, let's do it like this. What When there was a fire or something happened, the Red Cross only provided what as far as assistance to the individuals. A hundred dollar food voucher and then two nights in a hotel. They would put the family up for two nights in a hotel. But when you lost everything, every single thing that you own, right? that just didn't cut it. Two nights, you know, I mean, that would be maybe enough time for it to sink in, you know, truly, not for you to, you know, get your, get your life together. Uh, so a lot of times my father would come out of pocket, you know, um, and he would put these families up in hotels for you know, weeks, months, you know, until he could help find them a place to live. Um, you know, he was, he was just passionate about it. You know, he was very, it just, it broke his heart to see people, you know, lose everything. You know, a lot of times they had children and, you it, know. Evidently that had an impact on you because you was pretty young when this, these things were happening. You saw this. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, he did that. He became a fire marshal, and I had graduated from high school by the time he had become a fire marshal. Um, and it was when I noticed it, I was in my 30s, mm -hmm. you know, when I really was paying attention to what he was doing, you know, listening actually to what he was saying. I was like, you know, it, it made me stop and think, you know, like, wow, you know, because he didn't have to do that. 
Mm -hmm. you know when he and then unfortunately your your father passed away Mm -hmm. and stuff and now you're continuing that legacy with a foundation based around your father yes um i call it be a blessing it's a nonprofit organization that i started uh, almost four years ago originally when i started it i was gonna um, help the homeless and then i found there were a lot of organizations that were helping the homeless and then i was sitting in my office one day and it was like an epiphany so i feel like it was my father that was there that was like you know what why aren't we helping these um you know these victims of fire Mm -hmm. And I knew enough people in the fire organization that I started reaching out to, you know, IFD, Be- you know, Beach Grove Fire Department and saying, hey, like, you know, I'm going to start accepting donations. And, you know, when these people, you know, are in need, you know, have them contact me. I also have a Facebook page where, you know, I put it out there as well. And, um, you know, I mean, it's it's been okay. What's the bigger picture here that you're trying to do for the individuals that, that suffer these um, uh, problems? I would like to obtain, um, you know, a residence, like um, an apartment building or, you know, some type of dormitory to where when these people, you know, lose their homes, you know, they can come for an extended period of time, whether that be three months, six months, nine months, you know, to come get their life together. Because unfortunately, some of these people didn't have insurance as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, everybody kind of takes that for granted. And yeah, just everybody has homeowners insurance. Well, no, they don't. You know, some people can barely afford to put food on their table, let alone get insurance for their house. So this would be a place for them to um, come and get shelter, come get their life together. How is that? How is that project coming along right now? Currently, it's not. It's at a standstill. Um, You know, uh, A, I need funding. You know, I need to uh, find a residence, find a dormitory, you know, somewhere that I can either, that's either retrofitted already, you know, for individual, you know, single family housing or something that I could retrofit to, you know, put four, six, ten units in. Tell the viewers, we shared, let's get a little personal here. Um, Tell the viewers, or let's share with the viewers your journey from childhood. There was a little bit of, um, a, how do I want to say it, unpleasant truth <laughs> in, in, in the home growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, share, share the viewers what you share with me so they can understand. Um, you know, unfortunately, at a younger age, um, I was sexually abused by uh, my mom's um, husband at the time. It wasn't my father, but it was my stepfather. That went on for some years. Um, you know, I didn't really tell anybody. He was a he was a pretty violent man. You know, he hurt my mom, hurt me and my brother. So I didn't really tell anybody until later in life when he tried to reach out to me. <clears throat> and, you know, it caused me to freak out pretty much. How old were you when he reached out to you? How old was it when these chain of events were actually taking place? It started when I was nine. Um, it ended when I was 11, almost 12. Uh, he found me again when I was 19, and I had just had my first daughter. And he wanted to see me and my daughter, and that was not going to happen. Why didn't you tell people? Why didn't you tell somebody that this was happening at that age? I did. Uh, One time I told my neighbor, and my neighbor told her dad. Her dad came over and confronted my stepdad, and then he beat the hell out of me and my mom. You know, like he really took it out on my mom. So... And he always told me that he would kill my my family, you know, my mom, my brother, my dad... And I believed it. How would how did that affect you moving forward as a as a child? Did were there any did the school or anybody recognize any any signs that you was being abused at at all? They recognized the change in my behavior. Um, I became I became aggressive. I became you know I I I became a bully. Is what it was. I used to beat people up all the time. My friends even, you know. Um, I just had all this anger that I didn't understand. You know, how could anybody else understand? They didn't even know what was going on inside of me. I didn't understand what was going on inside of me. And that was the only way that I knew how to express it was, you know, fight or fight or flight. And so I always chose to fight. Now you was, um, y- y- your father was still in the picture at the time. Mm-hmm. You say you had a close bond with your father. Was Why wasn't it easier for you to share what was going on with your with your father? My dad probably would have killed him. Well, I know my dad would have killed him. Um, But I think I was more concerned about my mom because my mom was still with him. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
and I had seen firsthand, you know, some of the things he had done to my mom already. And so I think I was just, you know, more worried for my mom at that point. Did that make, then what was the next, what did you do after that when you got older and this guy reached out to you? You, you lived in silence, the code of silence. You mm -hmm. didn't tell nobody, uh, at least a very few people. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to take the viewers into a young girl state of mind moving forward, but definitely this code of silence is mm -hmm. still there. So you got this guy that's coming back into your life after you had your, your, your first daughter. daughter. You mm -hmm. married, how old was when you had your first daughter? I was 18. Um, it was, yeah, I graduated in May and I had my first daughter in July. Were you married at the time? Uh, no, I got married nine months afterwards to um, the father of both of my daughters. Um, yeah, um, so we were 19 when we got married. Um, mm -hmm. That's when he reached back out to me, uh, my ex-stepfather at that point in time. How did you react? All of a sudden, here is a guy I, that's calling you, and you're like, what the hell? I freaked out. Um, yeah, I freaked out. I had to go into therapy um, because it was like a, a flood of um, memories. You know, like I had suppressed them all. But then when uh, he wanted to see me and my daughter, you know, it, it freaked me out. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I spent many years and many thousands of dollars going to therapy. But I also, um, I tried to prosecute him, you know, which I think is important for people to know. You know, I did try and prosecute him. This what happened. made you decide to actually prosecute him? What was, what was the breaking point that says, I'm not going to allow you to do this anymore? My daughter. He wanted to see my daughter, and there was no way in hell I was ever going to let him come. Why did he feel he had to see your daughter? I don't to, know. To repeat what he had done I, to you? I, that, I don't know. And, but that's what I was afraid of. Okay. You know, and there was no way I was going to let that happen. So, um, uh I, I spoke up. Um, my uncle was a cop at the time, and so um, I went out to my uncle's house and I told my uncle what happened. Mm -hmm. And my uncle is actually the one that called my father, and uh, he came out, and then my uncle helped me tell my dad. How did your dad react? This is this is this is the big mm. giant here. Yeah, he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy at all. Um, you know, my my uncle's pretty level headed, and I think he had talk some sense into my father but um yeah I mean obviously my, my dad wanted to go after him you know but you decided to take the bull by the horns mm -hmm. and 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 prosecute was it a difficult journey to prosecute or did the statutes of limitation play into this you not being able to pursue I, I couldn't go after him cri criminally because the statute of limitations had run out by that time but I was able to go after him civilly and I did win and my only reason for going after his him civilly was because I wanted him to admit what he had done to me. And that was part of the settlement, is he had to admit what he had done to me. The accountability yes. made a little bit more relief. Did the, But the pain still stays there. Are you still, um, what are you doing now to heal from that? And what do you tell the viewers that may have had this um, impact on them? Well, First of all, it's not your fault. You know, um, you know, that was a big thing. I had a lot of guilt for a long time. Um, but I didn't let what happened to me define me, though, either. You know, um, it made me stronger as a person. I do still have issues. You know, it caused me to have trust issues and just... What do you mean, like, trust issues? You know, because this was a person, this was an adult that, you know, loved my mother and was supposed to be a father figure to me. You know, was supposed to protect me, not hurt me. Right. You know, and then not only did he not protect me, but he abused me, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally. You know, I saw him do it to my mother, my father, or not my father, my brother. You know, it it was, it just wasn't a good environment. How did it affect, you You got married, so did you keep this secret from your from no. your husband? So you told your, your husband, you was both young at that time, yeah. too. So how did that manifest? It kind of sucked because um, I was a mess. I was an emotional mess. I mean, it got to the point where he lost his job and lost his third shift job because I couldn't stay alone all night long. I was scared if I heard any little thing, you know. I thought it was him coming in the door to get me and my daughter. Um, and I'm not a person that's easily scared. Right. You right. know, so, again, you know, I was a bully, so I didn't. Well, I, you both were young, too, so I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure the process and thought on his part was like, maybe this is too much for me. to. Yeah, it was tough, you know. Um, it was really tough. You know, I'm sure it I'm sure it played into the demise of our marriage, you know. What about your children, the ones that you really try to protect from this? Did they see their mother going through that? Did you shelter them from that? Um, I tried to shelter them from it as they got older, you know, because 
I was in therapy a lot. You know, there were times that. I'm pretty sure they asked mom what's going on as they got older. Well, I've I've always had a real open door, open book policy with my kids. You know, I mean, probably too open at times. Mm -hmm. You know, I've I shared with them what was going on when I thought they were old enough to understand, um, because I thought maybe it would help them understand me some. Right. You know, why I was so overprotective, you know, why I acted the way that I did, why I was so manic or, you know, obsessive about certain things, about them going out, them couldn't, you know, them not being able to go out alone. And, you know, I thought if I shared that with them, they would understand more. Jason. Oh, there we go. Um how is the relationship now with your daughters moving forward, knowing that they know what their mom went through? We have a great relationship. Um, you know, my children are older now. They're 24 and 26, and we actually have an amazing relationship. We have a really, really strong bond. Um, we have a very open relationship. Um, you know, they can come to me about anything, and they do. You know, there are times that I go to them. You Did, know. Where's your dad? Did your dad live long enough to see the outcome? Of, of what you went through with the prosecution and, and so forth. Yeah, he did. He did. And he was proud of me for that. You know, he was happy that I did that. Um, you know, and it served me years later as well. Um, if anything, just vindication, you know, um, just different things that I did. You know, this man was a part of a church and that church was not aware that he was um, a child abuser. So I made them aware that, you know, he very much molested me and I took them the court papers for my proof. And he was no longer a member of that church, but I felt that was necessary because he was around other young women, mm -hmm. you know, that potentially could be victims because who knows how many people he affected. You know, he was a sick man. Okay, we're not going to go that much more deep. I think that people understand mm -hmm. that's a lot to do, but now you move forward. Mm -hmm. And we talked about some of the great things that, 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 that you're doing despite, um, those, those battles, you, mm -hmm. you conquered them, you was able to move on, yeah. but now you're doing something to, to not only impact the community, but to help young girls, individuals, um, with a new product, Kush Cola. I do. I am. Um, Kush Cola is a marijuana infused beverage. Okay, wait a minute. Marijuana now. We got some viewers going to go, what the? <laughs> okay. Why all of a sudden the Kush Cola and the marijuana? What made you decide to go that route? It's, uh, you know, I very much believe that marijuana is medicinal. You know, um, I've educated myself enough to know the medic medicinal benefits of marijuana. Um, I personally love marijuana you know um i very much support it i've been in the legalization of medical marijuana here in this state i've been in um uh activists for 15 plus years you know trying to get marijuana legalized no tell me tell <laughs> tell, tell the viewers a story about you coming to work and you was already fucked up <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll just say, um, you know, I'm, I'm a paralegal as well, so there are some attorneys that I work for, and there was this particular attorney that he happened to smell marijuana on me that day because I had been smoking right before I came into work, which mm -hmm. I did every day. Right. So, um... You did it every day, and they just now smelt it at one time? Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm sure he smelt it, but this was the time that he said something. Maybe he could tell that I was, you know, super high. I don't know. But, yeah, I mean, I did every day, you know, so... He said something to me about, you know, you're not going to be able to get any work done. And I was like, what? Have you lost your mind? Like, I'm in here every day busting my ass, getting all this work done for you, and I'm high every day. What are you talking about? Right. You know, I'm not I'm not the stereotypical, you know, oh, I'm going to smoke a joint, and then I got to, you know, or, uh, you know, I act all silly and lay down. And so he thought he was just going to give me some busy work for the day, and he had been trying to get this uh, project done for three three years. You know, he had gone through several, I think, like four paralegals at that point in time, and he had been trying to get this project done for three years. And so he gives me this project. He's like, ah. Well, four and a half later, four and a half hours later, I have the project done, and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm done. And he's like, what? 
Did he ask for a joint after that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. But he just, he could not, you know, he just was beside himself. He couldn't believe that, you know, here I was high and I was able to be productive. And I'm like, man, like, you're educated enough. Like, educate yourself. You know, here, let me send you some, you know, some educational material. Educate yourself. And, yes, he does. He is a marijuana supporter now. now <laughs> I can tell you that. Now, share, share, share with the viewers. The the impact story that you told me, which was really heartfelt, about you're, you're definitely um, a believer in in the product and uh, and stuff. But you shared something with me that I thought was very inspirational, and you, I can tell when you was telling me you know, there there had to be some tears rolling down your eye. You physically have met individuals that were suffering from 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 pain, and the only way that that pain was was set aside was through the use of uh marijuana yeah that's very very true um i've known several people that have suffered from cancer and you know there's a lot of different forms of marijuana you know way that ways that marijuana can be consumed um, ways, ways that marijuana can be made um that help different things um you know concentrates help people that have cancer they slow down the cancer growing process they kill cancer cells you know and i've seen that firsthand um you know marijuana also helps uh chronic pain inflammation um you know all who types was, who of was the one lady now you ain't got to mention her name but who was the one lady that really brought you down you you physically witnessed her and the pain she was going through yeah um you know it was it was just a lady that i had been associated with through um some non non-for-profit organizations that i've been associated with through the year years for mm -hmm. the legalization of marijuana and she had cancer you know um a lot of chronic pain as well and you know besides just the depression of all of it you know she's thinking she's gonna die you know the doctors were telling her she was going to die and myself and a few other people that I knew really close, um, you know, we pointed her in the right direction where she could get the things that she need, and she still lives now cancer-free. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, Kush Cola. Yes. Kush Cola, that's your baby, <laughs> Kush Cola. I yes. remember when you told me about it, and I was like, okay, I don't know how it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna pan out. Um, and. You know, we live in a world now where 2020 has just been like total amazing. You know, we 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 dealt with some some good, the bad, and the ugly, and now marijuana is sort of being um, a, a a major topic. Mm -hmm. And you decided to now, where really before the topic even became where it is now, you had already went out and started an entrepreneurship with with Kush Cola. Yes. Um, myself and my business partner, um, who's also my best friend. Who's your business partner and best friend? We can give her some shots out. Jenny Jen. Uh, Jenny Jen. Jen um, Kersage. Okay. Uh, she is the co-owner of Kush Cola with me. Okay. Um, we, we bought a company out of Michigan. Uh, we did some development with that company. We had a, a big launch party in Detroit, and it went amazing. Um, High so, Times was there. So why Michigan versus Indiana? Because it's legal in Michigan. Okay. Um, and, you know, Indiana, it's still not legal. Okay. So um, we currently, we still do everything out of Michigan and Jamaica. Okay. So it's legal there, mm -hmm. and you decided to launch everything there. So mm -hmm. explain to the viewers what exactly is the launch, what is the product about, and um, um, why are you so into the <laughs> Well, um, I'm so into the Kush because it's Kush. Uh, <laughs> but um, we take... Uh, you know, we take cannabis, cannabis concentrate, and we infuse beverages. So currently, uh, we infuse um, carbonated soda beverages. We have seven different flavors. Uh, we have um, our product was 100 milligrams. Uh, when we come back out in December, we'll have three different strengths of um, three different strengths. What strength is, is what strength are you currently operating on right now? 100 milligrams, but then we'll have like two 250, and then around 400 milligrams. What's what's is it, a lot. What what is what is the different effects of all all of those milligrams? Uh, well, when you ingest cannabis, it's very much uh, like an edible, so you're going to get a body high. So it's just going to sit you down and relax you, maybe make you take a little nap. Mm -hmm. uh, versus the head high. Um, What's that? What's a head high? Ah, uh, it makes you real giggly and you know, la la la. Okay. Just, um, but this one is just uh, it's it's 
it's uh, yeah, it's just gonna mellow you out. And then what's the highest going to do? With what, what was it, 400 milligrams? Yeah. What's that going to do? It's going to put you to sleep. Oh, put me it's, to sleep. It's, it's definitely, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sit you down and maybe make you stuck for a minute. Just Jason, we have a picture of Chris <laughs> Cola for the viewers to look at what it, what it, what it looks like. I should have brought a bottle. Is he legal here in the I United have States? empty bottles. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the mission here is, um, the mission right now currently is to try to get kush cola here and mm -hmm. i was hoping we was going to get a a a good there it is Ooh, looks good kush cola okay i like that okay what's the flavors i'm looking at purple punch russian cream which is like a cream soda um agent orange which is like um orange and then um the original so that would be our um, our cola version, we'll just say that. Now, this product is is available currently, but only in Michigan. Actually, it's not available because we're sold out in Michigan. We go back into production uh, December, January. Um, we had a launch party, and we sold out. Michigan changed its regulations. Um, There's a lot of things, so we had to move our production facility. Um, we were able to secure a new production facility, and it's currently being retrofitted for us to move in and start uh, mass production again. So right now in Indiana, your your quest is to try to get this legalized here so you mm -hmm. can provide jobs by obtaining the old Coca-Cola plant, which I think is a great idea. If it, I, I know at one point in time it was still available. I don't know that it still is, but if it still was, that would be perfect because they have the bottling machines and stuff already. Because if you go to try to buy those new, you're talking millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. A semi-automatic bottling machine starts about $250,000 and goes up from that. And that's, you're still doing a lot of things by hand. But when you have, you know, big bottling uh, units, conveyor belts, you know, I mean, that would just make things so easy. <laughs> you know, production would be so much better then. How hard is it to actually get the funding for a project like this? Naturally, you're trying to create jobs here. Mm -hmm. um, is a lot of education needed? Because I'm pretty sure you just don't want anybody messing with marijuana infused and so forth. Mm -hmm. So is it is the is the loophole and the legal ramification that difficult to bring that operation here to provide jobs for the community? The only way that we could bring it here right now is if we just did a straight CBD version. So, um, which we could do, and eventually we will roll out with just straight CBD. It doesn't have any THC in it, or it, or it has point zero zero five or less mm -hmm. of THC, which is nothing that's going to affect you. Um, yeah, no, it's not going to get you high. Uh, CBD is legal here. The CBD flower is legal here. Um, you know, we could infuse our drinks with CBD, but that's the only way we could be in Indiana right now until the laws changed. Is this an FDA product? No, not currently. And no cannabis product is going to be um, approved by the FDA because the federal regulations, you know, federally it's not legal yet. So once it becomes legal federally, then we'll be able to ship across state lines, you know, then we'll be able to have the FDA approve it, you know, um, but no, not currently. Is it quicker to, to um, for you to launch and, and, and insert your product back into the Michigan area? Well, heck, you can't even, how would they get it if, say, for can't. instance, they open up in Michigan and still won't be able to get the product? Um, well, once we open up in Michigan, um, our production facility, yeah, because we will um, then be abiding by the new Michigan regulations, which is you have to uh, produce your product in the facility where your license is held. So basically it cut out all the little mom and pops in Michigan. You can't just be, you know, making products in your kitchen anymore and selling them. That's what that did. You actually have to be in a production facility, which holds the license. How does your, your daughter, it's, it's daughter Friday week last the other day, right? Yeah. Did I get it right? So how, <laughs> no. did, how does your kids? No, you, you butchered it. <laughs> I butchered it. What was it? Last Friday. Da daughter day, right? Daughter yeah, day. National was daughter was day. National daughter, daughter day. <laughs> What's Friday? Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. <laughs> Always keeping me on my toes. All right. So you have two beautiful daughters. Mm -hmm. So how are they looking at mom in the, the ventures in Kutz Cola? They support me, um, you know, 100%. Uh, you know, of course, they've been aware of my passion for uh, cannabis for a long time and you know they've become educated in it you know um, 
they could not become educated and I've been advocating, you know, down at the state house and Who are some of, yeah, that's right. Who are some of the people that you're that you're partnering up with that on the on the political platforms that uh follow your you know your your dream i'm not necessarily a, um partnered up with those nonprofits anymore but some of the people that i've worked with in the past is jim lucas he is um, a major supporter of the legalization of marijuana here uh Sue Ann Kirshner, um uh cindy kirkhoff I, I don't i'm not saying her last name right um those are three off the top of my head um but the constituents of Indiana, you know, I've seen over the last five years, you know, the polls go from 40 to 50 percent up to 90 percent of people that support the legalization of mar medical marijuana here in the state. Who are the who are the big threes that are stopping it? Eli Lilly, Phils Pfizer and Roche. How does that make you feel? I think it's bullshit. You know, I mean, I think it's total shit because it's. They're money hungry, you know. It's big pharma. Eli Lilly, <laughs> Eli Lilly used to have can cannabis oil, cannabis oil in all of its products as its medicine. They have patents. They own patents on cannabis oil. They are very much aware of the medicinal benefits of cannabis. But heaven forbid, should it become legal here, and then you know people are being prescribed cannabis instead of opioids or any of the other you know drugs they're trying to shove down our throat because those are the real drugs you mm -hmm. know it's, it's not the stuff that we're growing from the earth you know so with that said with that said what would you like to see happen i would like to see you know at least medical marijuana become legal um also in the states where medical marijuana is legal you see the numbers of the opioid crisis decrease you know, like I would like to see that in our state as well because it's bad here. You know, what do you mean, like it's bad? The opioid crisis. You know, the people that are hooked on pain pills and you know their morphine, which leads to heroin. And I mean, we just have junkies all throughout the state. It's, is, is it's there sad. An, is there enough research to validate your ambition to 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 take this to another level? Yeah, yeah. I mean, then why aren't we talking about it if it's enough research out there? What's what's the what's the fear outside of, you know, money? It, that's it. it. It's the bottom dollar. You know, that's the only thing. I mean, and I'll tell you, once Eric, Eric Holcomb is out of office, you know, the people of Indiana will vote somebody into office that supports legalization of medical marijuana. Whoever our next governor is, they will support medical marijuana or they won't become our next governor. But don't you think there need to be some serious guidelines? I mean, I don't want to see a 14 or 15 year old child doing marijuana right no I, I i completely agree with you and yeah i do believe that there should be guidelines and regulations and rules and you know i mean we can look at the other 30 states where it's already you know i think it's 32 now uh states that are where it's already legal you know i mean we have all these different models that basically you can pick and choose from you know of how you want to run your state those states they're not in debt the opioid crisis is going down you know, um, a lot of the drunk driving cases are going down, you know, because people aren't, you can get high and drive, you know, like it's, it's not like alcohol, you know, and then the, and there's research for days to back anything up that I'm saying. But the, the reason why I'm having such a, a pause in between is because you're right. I'm not educated on the topic. Mm -hmm. That's why I got you here because Evidently, you done your deal, and you open up a company that um, um, uses the product. But I just, I'm trying to understand um, where do we draw the line with with it? You know, you're saying we should have it, and you're saying Indiana is 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 totally against it. But states like Michigan are there. What are their guidelines in states where it is legal? Well, it has to be, um, you know, prescribed by a doctor. You know, when you do get uh, a medical marijuana card you know you have to go through a series of tests not necessarily like blood tests or anything but you know there are you know physicians out there that that's what they do you know and um, they're educated in the benefits of mar of marijuana as well so you know marijuana it helps chronic pain it helps inflammation you know people that are going through chemo and they don't have any appetite you know it's going to help them eat um, you know cancer cancer patients you know that's a huge one you know and they know that like 
the scientists, there's the research out there. People know that cannabis kills cancer. Why aren't we putting more money towards that, towards research for that? You know, that's, that's the problem. And at the end of the day, it's all the bottom dollar and it's big pharma. You know, Eli Lilly knows that, ca that cannabis kills cancer. You know, like that, that's part of the reason I'm so passionate. My father died from cancer. I couldn't provide him with the medicine that he needed to a, either prolong his life or to help kill that cancer when we first found it. You know, he was a fireman. You know, he couldn't do anything slick because then he would have lost his benefits. You know, then, then who's going to pay for those medical bills? Me. You know, like, and it killed me to know that I couldn't help my dad when, you know, I can send people different ways to help them. But I couldn't help my father. You know, that, that doesn't sit well with me. I think... What do you need right now for people to do to help avoid the pain that you went through from losing your father to trying to provide jobs for people to try to educate people? What do you need the viewers to do to help you make these things happen? Get educated. Reach out. If you don't know how to get educated, reach out to me. I can. Um, how I can, can the viewers reach you? I can be reached reached on Facebook uh, via my name Angelique Bowers, via uh, my page Kush Cola, via my page uh, Be a Blessing, via my page Urban Gables Design and Restoration. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to leave an email that people can reach out to me on. Um, that's Angelique eleven seventy five at gmail dot com. I'm always looking to uh, work with any and everybody that can help in any of the causes I'm trying to do, whether it be nonprofit stuff, whether it be Kush Cola, um, you know, uh, advocacy and let you know legalization of medical marijuana, uh, empowerment of women. Tell me about that before we sign off. You're doing. You've been invited to speak. Congratulations Thank on you. empowerment of women. Explain yeah. that to our viewers. What's what's that entitled, and how did you get that? Um, the Indianapolis Women's uh, Leadership uh, Summit reached out to me and asked me to be a speaker for them. Um, I they had you know come up across my profiles, you know, done some look into my background, seen all the different things that I'm involved in, see the things that I do, and they reached out and you know asked if I could start being a speaker. You know, they thought that I had some good things to say, just. You know, because I had, I guess because I have so many different things going on, you know, paralegal. That's why I say you're you know, always cannabis at that owner, of mine. You yeah. know, <laughs> like, I'm trying, well, Kush Cola is down in Jamaica as well, so we took it to another country. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, and they love it down there. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're going to be expanded down there as well. Um, but, yeah, um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, we won't be able to have, I guess, a uh, get together, like, a gathering, a conference until next year. So we're doing everything, like, live streaming um, now is the uh, let is the Indiana uh, um, you mentioned Jim Jim uh, Lucas Jim Lucas mm -hmm. how um, how let me use the right word here how effective is his word you know his preaching of this into the thing is he is he is he a beast person yeah yeah he is um i love jim lucas uh you know he's he's big on uh second amendment amendment his gun rights and mm -hmm. he's big on legalization of marijuana um but he's been educated you know he's been a loud voice did you educate him or was he already educated I helped you um, our our nonprofit organization at the time. Uh, we sent him to a facility that educated him. Um, yeah, I remember you telling me that. Yeah, he got to see um, you know legal marijuana being grown from seed to harvest. Um, I can't say whether he did or did not partake. And right. Check that out, but um, you know he he got to see it. He got to see how the states regulated things, how things were tagged, how they were do, barcoded. Do you think a lot of the people are? too close-minded that if they did what Jim did actually go out and survey whatever that they might be reconditioned in their thought process I do Andre um, you know because if you see it you can't unsee it right you know what I'm saying and once you see it then it then it brings it all together um, but I I think people are becoming more open-minded I mean you kind of have to be because it's society now you know we have 30 plus states that are 
that you know have legal marijuana mm -hmm. you know it's everywhere um, and as long as it's used properly you know I mean it can be given to children you know children with seizures you know epilepsy you know it'll take you right out of a seizure you know so it's like there's a there's a lot of benefits and as long as it's done properly you know it can be good for any and all ages as long as it's not abused and of course it can be abused as well with that said we're gonna we're gonna wrap up i'm glad that you came on the show thanks um, thanks for having this, me this this was a topic that i really wanted to address I, I i'm glad you was able to educate me on it and i moving forward in 2020 um like the last episode that we had 2020 is a time for change and and mm -hmm. whether you before you knock it educate yourself that's on right it, um is 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 my uh, goal on it mm -hmm. um I'm glad that people like Jim Lucas are, are, are had at least the insight to visit, observe, and come back with data. And I will hope that the data that he came back with, that he can um, do the same with the people that's in the legislature and help make these laws. He really has been. You know, I mean, he's been a co-author and I believe an author of just himself of a couple of bills that, you know, he's tried to push through the Senate. Like, he has he's really been a loud voice you know um and people listen to him you know so it's he's from seymour i'm gonna do everything that i can to get him yeah, on the we show need to with get him you on the yeah. show and 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 hear his his viewpoints as well um i definitely encourage my viewers to to reach out to you i mean uh you're trying to bring jobs here you're trying mm -hmm. to bring uh uh awareness to um a situation that has affected your your whole family, even yeah. your father, and mm -hmm. more importantly, the uh, the um, childhood trauma. So that's mental that you're addressing with people as well. You bring a whole bunch of stuff on your resume, man. You should, <laughs> you, maybe you should run from some type of no, politics or no, something. No, <laughs> no, 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 no yeah. politics for me. I mean, that's a lot on your resume. <laughs> no. uh, with that said thank you for being on the show angelique thank hope to have you me. back um people please reach out support her uh if you don't uh know about it like i just said don't knock it before you try it but don't knock it until you educate yourself please um this is the andre the beast show tune in and watch another episode of the andre the beast show thank you thank you <laughs>